And for those of you that uh, might follow our podcast, The Business Communicators, you might recognize a few familiar faces. And we had Chris on episode 12 of season three, and uh, he is graciously uh, coming back and joining us for an IBC Houston webinar. So really quickly, let me go ahead and introduce my co-host, and that's Hattie Horn up in the maybe top left of your screen. At least I'm pointing to where she is on my screen. And then Thomas Bain, who is below me, and Thomas Bain is also a former IBC Houston president as well. But uh, the man that you came here to see is Chris Brogan, and uh, we're really excited to have Chris. He's the president of Chris Brogan Media, where he offers brand strategy and digital content and pres presence management to help businesses of all sizes. He's worked with Disney, Coke, Google, GM, Microsoft, um, you know, so many amazing companies. He's a New York Times bestselling author of nine books. He's working on his 10th, The Bat Pack Club. And Chris, we couldn't be more thrilled to have you join us on this IBC Houston webinar. So thrilled to be back with the team again. I'm practically one of you by this point. Yeah, I think we're gonna have to like send a, a members only jacket your way. So uh, shoot <laughs> us shoot us a text with your uh, with your size and we'll go from there. But before we get started, uh, we're actually going to do a little giveaway. Um, so if you can just take out your phones real quick and you if you can text Chris Brogan to 713-360-0133. Uh, Thomas and I are giving some stuff away. So Thomas is giving away a, a light. Uh, that you can put above uh, your computer. I know that a lot of you uh, are still working from home and doing Zoom calls, so we have actually coordinated with a sponsor to um, have this lighting kit, which is great. And then uh, a few weeks back on the podcast, we had a partnership with Staples and True Red, so we're going to be giving away some pens and a journal as well. Um, so if you're interested in entering that contest, uh, just text Chris. Brogan to 713-360-0133. And we've already got a few entries coming in. So thank you for that. But uh, without without further ado, let's get to the conversation with Chris. And Chris, I think that most of our audience knows who you are. And that's probably the reason why they joined. But from your perspective, what makes Chris Brogan, Chris Brogan? What makes me me? Uh, probably a, a lot of bad things, uh, you know, probably a whole lot of, you know, horrible things that just have gone on to be true. But no, I... I've worked in business in a, in a variety of ways for several years, way long ago. I had regular normal day job, like real people do like with the phone company uh, and then with a the wireless telecom. And then along the way, I just, I was working on things like blogging back when that was really early. I was in 1998. Uh, I was in podcasting in 05, uh, digital video in 05, like YouTube and all that. The whole concept of, of what I was doing was, uh, when I stopped doing my regular day job was just, boy, there's some really cool ways you could reach out and connect with people that are not the typical, you know, professional business communication sphere, but do have value. And I, and I was using 10,212 on Twitter because I thought, wow, there's really something here. Um, so it was in the early days of being Chris Brogan, it was a mix of the fact that I was a blogger and a video guy that people followed and then a podcaster to then being uh, one of these people who said, these social networks are really cool, not because of the tech, but because you can really do some cool customer service stuff. You can do some cool marketing, uh, comms, and there's just a lot of opportunities to earn a way to build a relationship. So I'm not especially bleeding edge. I'm, I'm not really even like a futurist per se. I'm just someone who as a business advisor has said to a lot of companies, you know, if you talk to somebody a little differently and you use the tools a little differently, you can make some cool relationship stuff happen. And that's how I've, you know, made my dimes uh, all along is just some mix of either helping people make interesting content or giving them some business advice that helps them uh, make bigger revenue by connecting with people and treating them like humans. I think humanization and relationship building are just so, so important when it comes to having success in business, you know, customer service, treating your customers right. And, um, you know, we want this conversation to be as interactive as possible. So for our attendees, feel free to drop any questions that you have for Chris in the Q&A box or the, the chat feature. And uh, we'll get to as many as we can throughout the conversation. But uh, Chris, you know, we've spoken a ton on IBC Houston webinars on like mental health and, and self-care and professional growth, professional development. And one of the things that you do every year is you kind of identify three words. And those three words are essentially your guiding light, I guess, for the year. And 
this year, you selected showrunner, monk, and options, and you said that if your team has too many options, they lose focus and flounder. If they feel stuck or lack of options, they feel pressure and anxiety. You said that you survived 2020 because of always seeking the option, looking for a next move. Those next moves kept you housed and fed in 2020, and that you'll do even better in 2021. So I'm kind of curious if you can give us more insights on the three words, why you do the three words, and maybe what benefit our audience can have from creating similar goals uh, in their career. Sure. Good question. The My three words practice, I started in 06 and it was just that instead of just having some goal that you're going to probably, you know, like resolutions, the majority of resolutions don't get beyond uh, the 19th of January. So you get 19 days in and you go, ah, I guess I'm good. You know, uh, a lot of the resolutions are not succinct enough for people to understand what they're supposed to do. Like, ah, I'm going to get in shape. Well, that doesn't mean anything like, you know, there's, there's not like I'm going to run five miles a day for all of this coming year or something. So there's that on the other side, we always kind of overfill our plate. It's like when we go to the buffet, you know, whenever we go to a buffet, we're like, I'm never going to eat food again in my life. So perhaps I'll put it all on today. Right. Which is not how buffets are supposed to work. You're supposed to just marvel at the fact that you could, if you wanted, have crab legs and mac and cheese and no one will ask anything too weird about you. Uh, I, I would, but. So with the three words, it's, it's, can I think of three different words that cover different parts of my life that will let me really think about how I want to conduct my days. So showrunner, you know, can I, can I do more than just communicate, but can I communicate in a way that, you know, matches a theme and, and has packaging and that, you know, it makes sense and that there's some entertainment to it. That's why I said showrunner. You know, and so that's my plan, but that's that one. For options, it was really just that concept of, uh, I said that leadership is options management uh, at some point last year. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's so true. Leadership is basically telling your team, like, stop focusing on that, focus on this. Or, you know, the team is like, I'm really stuck. I don't know what else to do. And you go, well, here's an option. And they go, oh my gosh, I totally could do that. And then they get going again, right? That's options, right? So I just wanted that. And, and I, that's, that word just saved me so much already. Um, I launched a company, a uh, new company idea in 2020 and no one bought. I was like, great, this is wonderful. Uh, 2020, end of 2020, beginning 2021, after I stopped advertising the thing I was selling, the uh, guy that I knew for years said, hey, can I buy that thing that you stopped selling? <sighs> okay. So, you know, it's an option, right? It's, it's, it's like you, you close your ice cream store and you open your taco store and they're like, the ice cream would be good right now. You're like, Whoa, and you say swear words. But, you know, the option is that I was able to spin it up and do it again. The monk one is just like, as we're in this time and as we've been in this quarantine, you get two choices. You can start paring down your everything, realizing all the things that don't matter, all the things you don't care about. Like, I'll give you an example. I haven't driven my car more than three miles since March last year. I drive a 2010 Camaro. It is the Batmobile. It is a race car. It is awesome three miles in a whole year because I was like, you know what? I don't need to go anywhere. I'm all right in lockdown. And you know, my groceries are like 200 footsteps away. And so I eat like a little French old man. I carry like two bags home. And you know, if I run out of groceries, I go and get another two bags. It's all good. So that's how I did my three words. The, the thing is that these work in business settings. They work at home. They work everywhere. So if you come up with three words, now, the, the, the one secret, not like this is a whole webinar on that, but the one thing is it can't be a phrase. Like if you're like, stay the course, that's a waste of words. First off, the is the least interesting word of three words you could ever have. Stay the course is really just kind of one plan. So if you maybe make that into something like, you know, navigate or, or hold or something, then you have two words left more of stuff you can set up. What uh, I've also noticed is if you change your words mid-year, you always fail that year. That year goes horrible for you people die, there's fires, um, probably get indicted. I mean, it's not good. So just stick to the three words. Don't change them. Just trust your gut. It's fine. You're not going to make mistakes. You just maybe have a good or bad year that year. It's all good. And that's what I got for you, Austin. Oh my God. I started laughing when you said you wanted to be the white Shonda Rhimes. I had a visual. Oh, I do. I'm, well, I had a visual. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Okay. <laughs> But I was just thinking also too, you know, you work with a lot of different leaders, you work with a lot of different teams and you're talk. And one of the things I think about all the time that people are always constantly talking about authenticity being and authenticity being the key to building trust. Yet 
they continue to stumble with when it comes to delivering on that. Why do you think that's the case? Uh, first off, I think it's really hard to, to like learn authenticity. I think that's like when people say, I want to become a thought leader. Don't say that sentence. Um, I feel like what happens with authenticity, I never use that word ever. Even saying it now, it makes me want to clean my mouth. Uh, it's because it's, it's one of those words you should never say about yourself. Number one, it's also one of those, like, if just like, you know, Hey, I'm Chris, I'm a thought leader. <laughs> um, but number two, all on the city off, 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 I see, I can't even say the word, all that Voldemort word. And I have in common is that here's what I think. Wh what it really means is I'm willing to really be me. I'm willing to really express the, the lion's share of who I am. Not, not all of who I am. There's always kind of that like hot mess line where people don't need to know, right? That's fine. But then the, the, the whole next piece of that is that instead of, you know, authenticity being, I am, you know, this kind of person you can trust. Why not you just do trustworthy things? Why don't you just make it so that when, like when people connect with me right now, there's only a few reactions they can have. He seems weird and funny. That's, that's good. Um, they can say, he doesn't seem all that smart. I don't know why they made this guy guess twice now. Uh, or they're like, there's something about him. I think I'm going to keep paying attention and maybe something useful will come out of this, this talk. Right? So all three are also authentic responses. People mistake the word authentic to also mean some, some level of goodness, just like integrity we think is goodness. If you're like, man, I hate tall people and I'm going to kill all the tall people in the world. Anybody over six foot two, they're out of here, right? You could be really authentic about that and you could be really have great integrity. Oh, that guy's six, three, out you go, right? Like that's authentic and that's in integrity integrity really just means the integratedness of what you do. And so I don't strive for authenticity. I strive not to be afraid. I strive to say, I'm going to tell people when they're naked. So I'm a big fan of like the emperor's new clothes. I go up to a lot of emperors and say, Oh, you're naked. And then we try to fix the problem. You know, a lot of people are worried about telling their boss something. You know, one great way to run your own company is your boss fires you all the time anyway. So it's good. Uh, you basically are a client scenario with, with your, your people. So I feel that if, if you work about being less afraid and more sort of in love and the love part, you have to love you. And anyone who is uh, watching saying, oh my gosh, I really don't love myself. I get it. Lots of people feel that way. Lots of people don't love you. But um, also to learn how to love yourself that's the hardest thing in the world. That's why we made therapy and drugs. Um, so once you learn how to love yourself, you need less therapy and less drugs. So all you got to do is kind of work towards those goals. But once you get there, it's like the matrix. It's at the end when he realizes he doesn't have to dodge the bullets anymore. That's you. Once you get the love thing handled and the fear thing handled, that's all of it. Well, if you don't like the word authentic, authenticity, authenticity, whatever. Uh, authentic. You don't. Yeah, no, I, I don't either. You really get your mouth washed ready for this one. I want to hear your thoughts on uh, authenticity, oversharing, you know, the, hey, we need to be more vulnerable online, legal coming in. No, you can't because that's going to set us up for lawsuits. Or the other one is, oh, man, we really should have run that by legal. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts and how do you navigate those waters? So legal really, really, really has some very important roles in this. And it's really tricky. And as somebody who absolutely will tell you everything, you know, inside or outside of a company. Um, I've bounced against legal a few different times where they're like, mm. but there's a difference. One thing you have to kind of remind legal about is you remind them at every turn, it's your job to make sure I'm not harming this company. It's, it's your job to, I'm not harming the company. Am I saying something that maybe puts the company in a different light? Sure. Right. But so I think that there's, I think it's great to run things by legal. I think it's great to have that into the flow. I think it's just so much better than the other way around. And it's way better if the legal team exists with that premise, like, Hey, I'm not here to take all the fun away. I'm not like the big wet blanket, but I'm really here to help you not step on a landmine that you don't want to step on. Like, it's not going to be any good. You know, for instance, if you make, I don't know, pogo sticks, and you say to somebody, hey, it'll be kind of fun is putting some cream cheese on your pogo stick. And then a bunch of people break bones because maybe that's not a good mixing, right? Like 
you said it so you're you're responsible so there goes the law so like it'd be great if, if legal said maybe don't tell them to put cream cheese on their pogo stick even if you think that's cool so uh like there's a benefit to them there but then the other side of that thomas is just that um you have to remember you have to remind legal that they're not there to be the the, the really awful cold uh wet blanket they're there to make sure that you keep the company safe and so that you kind of keep that relationship going but it, it's tricky i i think especially i love to overshare um but i want i want legal to kind of keep the uh know where their lane is basically i want them to know that if i talk about my poop habits that's probably not going to ruin the corporation uh you know unless i'm selling an anti-laxative and then maybe i have to think about that too chris it's hard to keep a straight face when we're having conversations with you and and just for background when we had chris on the podcast i think we initially thought it was going to be a 30 minute conversation i think we chatted with him for i don't know hour and a half or so and the laughter was just insanity so we hope that you're enjoying this conversation so far and if you can just please leave any comments or questions that you have in either the chat box or the the uh the q a we'll get to as many as we can that we um throughout this conversation but i like what you said a few moments ago that you strive not to be afraid um you know we've been huge advocates on this podcast and and, and really ivc houston about seeking discomfort and you know, kind of going back to your three words, we had a follow-up question that came in via the text line, and it was, what inspires you with your three words to keep you motivated? You know, is it a ritual? Is it a person? How do you hold yourself accountable to those three words and, you know, seek out, you know, not being afraid and, and, and discomfort? How, how do you kind of manage that? So I don't have very many rituals, uh, but one of my rituals is to remind myself of my three words every day, because I feel like if you don't, you're just not going to get to it. There's a lot of times in our life where we say, well, yeah, no, I totally know. I, I totally know that one, Dale. And, you know, we don't, we don't do a thing because we feel like we know it ahead of time. But, but what I feel like is if you don't have a few, so I call them action stacks. They're basically like repeatable project plans. So like when I come to sit down to do this webinar with you, I went through my whole action stack on what I do when I run a webinar, turn off my email platform, turn off all the notifications I can find, uh, to shut down the HVAC so that I don't accidentally turn on heat or, air, or cold air, you know, so you don't like we're talking, I was, I was like, Whee! You know, I try to fix all the things I can think of, make my phone on stun. Um, I have a real, I'm really fidgety. So I have my little prayer beads with me so I can make sure I fidget underneath the screen. Um, so what I also find is that if I have a little rundown list, so to speak, like we call our action stacks, if I had a rundown list of the things that matter to me in any given day, then I, I, can, I find that I can basically operate professionally a lot better. So one of them is my three words. Another two or three might be around specific goals that I have for a given day or week. And then sometimes it's just a reminder of, you know, maybe I've been trending in a particular way. You know, maybe I've been, I've been grumpy a lot lately. So I just wrote the word grumpy on my notes. And so the last bunch of days I've been trying to be less grumpy. And then one of my show guests today canceled. Uh, they, they confirmed last night and then canceled today two hours before. So then I turned to the grumpy where it was reminding me not to be. And then I put exclamation points and devil horns. I intend to be grumpy now for all of next week. I'm scheduling it. <laughs> we do we do understand about guests uh, canceling on you at the last minute. We have the three of us and we just kind of talk to each other all the time. And so we can do that. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about um, I don't know if you've recently heard or read about Ellen DeGeneres and the things that are going on with her show and her um, her audience has dropped. The numbers have dropped for a while and it's about her brand. And, you know, one, one, one thing about her brand is it's about being kind, but that's been taking a negative slide due to you have employees who are accusing her of having a toxic workplace and her not being a very nice person. Have you ever worked with a leader in this type of position uh, to kind of help rehab their brand as a result of negative feedback? Love that question. Boy, Ellen, call me. Um, <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard because I think a lot of times there's sort of certain presumptions. Like, so, you, so if you're in like a corporation type setting, a business corporation setting, um, you want the leader to be visionary. You want the leader to be very decisive you would presume you want all humans on this planet to be kind. 
but kind is very different. And I think one of the things Ellen said oddly as, as a vague attempt at defense was like, I guess it wasn't cool to pick the nice lady as my brand. And I thought, well, you know, first off, nice and kind are two different things. You know, kind is a pretty basic human requirement, right? Like hold the door for people or someone's choking. Can I bring you some water? Someone's crying. You know, I'm here right now. What what, what do you need? How can I help? Right. That's basic human kindness. Nice is, you know, um, I heard you were sad that you couldn't go visit your mom. And so I made, I scheduled a phone call. So you and your mom have a couple hours right now. So at least we could talk and who knows, maybe we'll see where it goes from there. Right. So I haven't, I haven't been hired to rehab a brand in failure, but what I, what I fairly recently got rehired to do, not rehired, hired to do was there's a guy who is doing really good at sort of expressing his brand, but he has to magnify it a lot because he just took in a great sum of money. He's been acquiring a bunch of companies. Now these new companies that he's acquiring don't know him. And so they only have, or, or some people know him, but not the rank and file employees. And so now there's like 50 or more to a hundred more employees who don't really know that they can trust what this person says, who don't know that, you know, uh, he's that cheery all the time for real, even in private. And so I've been kind of coming out with language uh, to help that person not say really trust me, believe me, I'm a good guy. Cause like that never works. There's nothing more scary than someone saying I'm pretty honest. Like, why are you telling me that? You know, it's a very uh, disheartening thing. You know, I'm not bad with a scalp your doctor to say that. So, you know, I'm trying to get them to, to execute language that makes people think about, you know, oh, well, the kind of person who said that is probably this kind of person. That's my, you know, bank shot to that. But I would say that the other, uh, the other thing I can give for advice in that space in general, as far as, you know, if you're not a super nice person, well, you can always try to own that too. You can always try to own, I'm not a nice person. You know, people know some things about me, like as funny as I am and all that, I could be grumpy. Like when I lose a guest, if I lose a guest, I'm going to say mean things and swear about you to complete strangers. Uh, And I'll do it, you know, over and over again. And it gets to be known about that. Or people will say, you know, Chris is not a bleeding edge technologist. So if you go to him super excited about Clubhouse, get ready to hear him say not nice things back to you. Uh, And I just own it. That's just who I am. And Clubhouse is okay-ish, but like it's really not the greatest thing since sliced bread, just like Snapchat wasn't, just like who cares about Twitter spaces. Nobody cares, except that it's purple. So I feel like Prince missed it by a few years. But there I am. So that's that's all I got. And so my thought is just that with regards to rehabbing brands, sometimes you can't. Sometimes you have to, you know, accept and kind of take on who the new version of you is. And other times you just have to accept that maybe she could have led with, I'm the, I'm a jerk bag, but I'm gay. <laughs> like that would be a good, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm a mean gay person. That would have been a great, I like it. Well, Chris just mentioned clubhouse and I feel like that's a, uh, that should be a plug for, for us. We actually started a clubhouse room called business communicators we tried to put the business communicators in there but there was a character limit and so we were just stuck with business communicators unfortunately so we're going to be having Mm. chats there um you know i think starting on friday is when we're going to have a conversation but chris i I do have a question for you and it's it's sort of actually based on a conversation that i had with thomas before this conversation so thomas feel free to jump in here but i feel sometimes as just human beings we are kind of hesitant to honest feedback about ourselves. Uh, you know, whether it's coming from someone that we manage or someone that manages us, I think sometimes we can get defensive, especially if it's, you know, a pet project or something that we're really passionate about. And maybe we're trying to get honest feedback or, uh, you know, potentially a survey. And instead of maybe doing things the correct way, you know, double blind and I'll let Thomas go into all the analytics on what a true survey should be. but sometimes we're just putting this information out to an echo chamber and not really getting adequate information that can help us improve, but rather just, you know, confirming our biases. Uh, How can you actually go about, you know, one, not taking things personally as a communicator and then leveraging any feedback that you get to, you know, not emotionally hurt you or, you know, knock your ego down a little bit, but maybe, to help elevate you and and push forward 
and continue to move on. Thomas, am I missing anything from our conversation earlier today? I was about to say, warning, we're going to talk some uh, marketing talk now or advertising talk. Is, is So many times we see marketers or communicators trying to justify what they did versus have the results of what they did. And so, so they craft these metrics or surveys to stroke their egos. Um, and the highly successful people I, I, I see are the ones who are open feedback. Hey, we messed up. I'm at junior middle or the toxic ones that are like, I don't want any feedback. And so to Austin's question, how do you one help break down those walls to yourself, but then how do you work with others who just won't hear it? Those are a couple of interesting questions. So, um, as you may guess from the previous parts of this conversation, I love honest feedback. Call me stupid all day. I'm here for it. But what one thing is, first off, I mean, when you're looking for feedback, you have to make sure it's from places that you know have a vote, you know, that deserve a vote. So, like, I don't want my peers to say if I'm good or bad because I don't think they're good. Like, usually, I think I'm doing it right, and they're they're wrong. So I don't want my peers to tell me. I would like the people I'm serving to tell me. So either my boss or my customer, I need them to tell me I'm all right. You know, and one of the things that I think we're uh, never seeming to do when, when it comes to these kinds of situations is I, I feel like we never ask the question in that way that we could be open for a little bit of suffering. And I think that maybe that's the easiest way to do it. Cause they'll be honest guys, did I do okay? Like, yeah, what are they going to say? Yeah, you did fine, right? Like there's, you, you're being set up to not say that you did fine. But one thing I've done a lot, like for instance, we just sent out a, um, we did a, we did a big, big survey of here's our big sales page on my, on my other company owner media group. We did the, here's the insider page. This is the thing we're selling. We want to sell the most. What did you, you know, you didn't buy. So can I ask you five questions based on what you didn't buy? You know, what did you think of the message? Did you feel like, you know, did you believe we could execute on what we said we could execute? Number two, did we not answer a question we thought you might have? Anything you might ask for a sales landing page, basically, we get all the way through it. And, and we say, and, and it's not double blind, it's, it's, it's double lit up. We like see you, we know it's you. We specifically want you to know that we know it's you. And all the, by the way, we'll give you a month of it just in case you just, you know, weren't that wishy-washy, you just thought about buying it, you just chose not to. Here's a month of it, come get some. Um, we got great feedback that was immediately quick and easy to throw, even though it's all anecdotally written. It's all, it's all like, you know, paragraphs. Uh, we immediately saw things that people didn't like and wanted different and, and that we just didn't, there was a lot of kind of like, well, you say one thing, but you don't really demonstrate it in any way that we could see outside the paywall. So we don't know whether or not we should believe it. Well, that was great feedback. So, so, Ask the question. Let me sum up what you've what you've asked, and hopefully, I've got most of it. Ask the questions to the right people. Number one, it doesn't benefit you to ask the wrong people. Number two, ask the most vulnerable version of the question you could ask that doesn't lay it all at a knife inside you, but more like, what would you do to 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 fix this piece? Because you know, giving people you know carte blanche to to shoot you, they'll fire until there's no more clip, bullets in the clip. So you know, say, what would you do if you were running this stupid show? Uh, and then the third, I guess, and, and to me, one of the most important is if it's, it, you ask the question, how can you, uh, you ask the question, how can you uh, get the people who aren't so great with feedback to start taking feedback? My very first thought was tie it to money, you know, tie it to the way you get money around here is you show me uh, a reported flaw that somebody says is your flaw and what you did to fix it. And hint, if you said, I didn't do anything because it's not a flaw you won't see any money for sure. I need you to show me, here's what I did to address this, even though I don't necessarily agree with it. And that's, that's how I would handle that one last part, money. I, you know, compensate the response you want. And I, I think that uh, it would be amazing to have a company that internal and external feedback drove their check. Uh, I don't think we'll see that that much in this universe, but boy, do I wish. We've got a question here from one of our uh, participants. It is Nancy. Uh, she wants to know, what are your best suggestions for those of us who are communications counselors to our CEOs? Uh, that may or may not be a little bit open-ended of a question. Um, I guess if I gave you really open-ended answers to that, Nancy, I'd say brevity. 
Um, teach them to be more brief. I would say clarity, teach them to use fewer words and get more clear. I would say uh, get better with video. There's a lot of people for whatever reason think that this video thing is a uh, fad. So no. Um, and I would also say um, in that same process, learn how to convey real human interaction at a distance through a lens because it's for the very foreseeable future, you're going to need to use this skill. It did not begin and end in 2020, weirdly. Uh, and, you know, we don't know when it ends. And my uh, assumption is that it will go beyond the uh, getting back to work 100%. It'll go beyond, you know, the masks off time in our life because it's going to be really hard to put the remote work genie back in the bottle. And so I think that anybody is going to have to be trained and educated how to be a much better uh, distance participant from now on. I like that concept counselors to the CEO. Uh, I, call, I call my CEOs. I'm their puppet master, but yours is okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so Sorry, no worries. No, no, no. You derail my thought. Cause I'm like, Oh, let's go about talk about puppet masters now. Um, you mentioned you're not on the bleeding edge, but you've mentioned a lot of new technologies or new things with the, uh, you know, how to get your CEO or your spokesperson more comfortable with the different things. What are some of the technologies or new latest and greatest things since sliced bread that you could possibly see coming down the line that you might want to test out? You mentioned Clubhouse or something along those lines. Sure. Uh, so on the one hand, just a real basic set of hardware. So you see my little microphone here. I have an external cam. I have a light very similar to the one that you're going to give away. Um, these are going to become so super vital. I couldn't do that. I couldn't find the light switch. They're going to become so super vital to everybody putting together communications at a distance. This is learning how to tie your tie. This is understanding that, you know, maybe your belt and your purse have to match or whatever, right? So I think that on the one hand, that for sure, just getting a video set up and just shut up and do it and get it over with because, you know, it, it, we're talking maybe a couple hundred bucks tops and every employee that has public facing needs to stop just talking out of their laptop lid. I saw one of the biggest advertising companies in the world do a presentation, three out of the four people lids. And I was just like, you sound awful. You look awful. The way they have their laptop set up, they're looking down at the camera lens. Like every single part of it, like was derailing my ability to consume what I think might have been utterly valuable information for me, but I could not endure it. I was just like, I hate all of you. And I want to stab you all right now, which is a technical term for maybe bad communicators. Um, things like clubhouse, Clubhouse is, is big right now because we're, we don't have conferences and trade shows to go to. The IABC regional and national events are gone. I can't bring my stack of business cards and try to throw them into your stomach like I'm a business card ninja. So I have to do something. So I go on Clubhouse and Clubhouse is basically this weird situation where people elbow their way to the, the one you know pretty microphone in the room and hope to say something. And what, what do you see 80% of the time when you go in there is somebody talking way too long about nothing interesting. Uh, they finally hand the mic to somebody else and they're like, I'm going to be really brief, which is a sentence that means I'm not going to be really brief. Uh, not so much of as a question as a comment, they're going to read you a book. Um, and I just, I, there's a thing in marketing where I, my friend said it once and it's always been true is like when we show up at places like it, this is why we can't have nice things, right? There's nothing good about that platform unless you accidentally stumble into non-marketers, non-business communicators who are doing something really interesting and you're like, this is great. And then you go click into something you know, called business communicators, not even the business communicators, just business communicators. Like it's just some random communicators. You know, they're not even, they don't even know you're the, artic the articulate one, you're the, um, well, what are they gonna do? They're gonna sit around, you know what they're thinking the whole time they're not talking? Well, when I get my chance to talk, where do these guys find out how amazing I am? They're going to cancel their plans for the week. They're already clicking on my bio. They're following me. They're my new best friend, right? That Nothing like that happens on Clubhouse. You sit there like thinking about suicide, looking up at the ceiling, waiting for your turn to say something. Um, and then if you ever finally do get the chance to speak, it's usually when you're in the bathroom pooping. 
So like, there's no chance you're going to sound as articulate because you're like halfway between a grunt and they finally called on you after 86 other of their friends on the stage. And they have that whole list of moderators that are before you. So it looks like a series of generals. It's like, do you need 79 people to moderate this room? I guess I'm really not good at chat rooms because I feel like me and one backup in case I faint is probably enough, you know? So I, I think I think some of these tools are going to fall into the toilet. I, what I really think is going to happen next is some big idiot is going to buy Clubhouse and then feel dumb about it right afterwards. But, you know, social, social audio is not the future. It already has a problem with people with uh, vision impairment, uh, uh, hearing impairment, sorry. Um, and it also has a whole bunch of other things that make it not the ideal thing once we can actually go to conferences and hug each other again. So I'm not, I'm not down. I don't have any other replacements though. I think, I think Clubhouse is interesting because in, in my opinion, and we said this on the podcast, I think it's just, it's an opportunity for the, the founders to flip and, you know, it's valued at over a billion dollars. So it's, you know, quick startup, quick, ex, quick exit. We make a few billion. We're good to go. Hands off. Um, I, but I do find the platform interesting and, and I do think it's been kind of cool to see what technology has really emerged over the last year. And Chris, something that you alluded to was having your own camera set up, having your own microphone, having your own light. And of course you've got the backpack show. We have a podcast, you know, we've got our microphones, our, th our third party camera, our lighting kit up here. And when it comes to communicating communications, so many of the people on this call, you know, the attendees, they are subject matter experts in their field, you know, whether it's social media, whether it's marketing, whether it's entrepreneurs, they're amazing at what they do. But I feel like sometimes as communicators, there could be a confidence issue and letting others know that we are good at what we do and bragging on ourselves. You know, maybe you don't have to start a YouTube channel or a podcast or anything like that, but if, if you're giving advice to communications professionals and maybe stepping outside of their comfort zone and letting them know that it's okay to brag on what you can do, it that maybe you should be seeking to get on podcast or be interviewed as a subject matter expert for something that you're good at, what kind of advice would you give, um, you know, to maybe boost confidence and, you know, for some of the communications professionals out there? You know, so I do a show where we have at least two guests a day every day. So there's 10 guests every, you know, we do weekday show five days a week, two guests. So it's 10 guests a week. Um, and that means that, you know, out of the 8 billion or so people on the earth, I'm going to run out at some point, but what I find is no one ever sends me a message that brags on them, that, that appeals to me. I never once see a message where someone goes, I have all these accolades. Oh my gosh. Let me just, I'm just going to push the Pope out of Wednesday. Wednesday's free. Can you come? Um, it, it just never happens that way. I never, ever think now that was an accolade, but what I do always want and the way everyone could get closer to, you know, more attention, more shows, more, whatever, is do you have a nugget of a story? that makes you want to find out more. I'll give you an example. We had this lady on, um, she did that, you know, Hey, you're adopted. She goes, yeah, well, you know, a lot of people were adopted. Hey, do you think I can find out who my real dad is? Well, I don't even, I think that's expensive. How much does that cost? She finds this person is going to do it for cheap. He comes back and goes, this is crazy. I found your relatives, your royalty. She's like, what? So she's Sierra Leone royalty. So uh, they make a connection, they make a phone call, they like kind of validate some bona fides. She's a princess. She's a full on princess. So of course I have a princess on my show because how many do you get to talk to in a given week? Um, and by the way, it turned out that her big thing was uh, she was doing all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, the important charities things and, and social issues and stuff like that. She, she didn't get like, she didn't get to like swim in a pool full of gold or nothing. It's not like coming to America too. She basically is bringing clean water to this tribe that's got some problems going on in their life. And it's, it's around Sierra Leone, which, which got hit pretty hard with some, some, some real troubles. Uh, and she, she got to handle it. That's cool. Um, we had a lady yesterday who was an orphan from the Congo who went on to be a diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion person. I, I've already interviewed something like nine DE and I people, but not a refugee from the Congo. So that's kind of cool. So, you know, we look for that. We look for the, the vaguely interesting story. My guest today, one of them uh, launched a podcast where she interviews only people 100 years old or older. And 
And I was like, oh my gosh, the wisdom you must learn, right? Like no one hearing that out of my lips didn't think, what would you learn on a podcast with a bunch of hundred year olds? The first guest they had, the first time they even tried to this concept, they hit record. I forget what they said. The question. A woman talked for four and a half hours. They made it into at least two episodes. There might still be two episodes on the cutting floor. Um, she just went. She was a hundred something years old. She was dying to tell somebody the story. And you know what her real life career was? Piano teacher. You don't brag about being a piano teacher. She was a piano teacher. She taught about 8 billion uh, runs of three blind mice or whatever. So Austin, I don't think you have to brag. I think you have to be a good story. And, and ultimately, when you're actually a guest on the show, you better damn well be able to tell that story. Because I had one, this woman like escaped from a, a, a cult. She escaped from a cult and I have her on the show and none of that comes out. She, she, I cannot get her to say it. And I'm having that part where I'm trying to think I must be the worst host ever because I can't gently do this. So like the last thing I've left is to yell in her face, you were in a cult, but I don't because like, obviously she's keeping that out of the storyline. It was the most stupid interview ever. So you have to be able to deliver on your story and you have to have a story that just fits in a sentence. It's not really how good a communicator you are. It could be anything. My grandfather played the best spoons ever, you know, whatever it is. My grandfather happened to be a candy salesman and I learned to read because he bought me comics at every stop he took me on. Right. That's a cool story. You're like, Oh, what kind of comics did you read? Like you, you already know the next set of questions. That's what any host wants. And as a communicator, you're, you better be interesting enough to be interviewed. Otherwise you're not that good a communicator. Are you? You're just a, I don't, I don't even know what the term is for someone who can't get someone to be interested in them. Mayonnaise. <laughs> you just made me think of something. Um, what about the leader or the CEO who you can't convince to communicate anything? Those are so hard. I don't want to say to, to work with, or they're not, and it, they don't think they're good at it, or they don't feel like they need to communicate anything. Have you worked with anyone like that? And then what were the things that you could do to convince them that this is the best strategy? This is what we need to do. I work with a lot of uh, company owners who are software engineer founders. And one of the Uh, the stereotype, you know, there's always truth in a stereotype uh, about software developers and engineers is they shouldn't be the voices of companies. Engineers say things in the worst possible way all the time. Like if an engineer uh, was a pilot of an airplane, he'd be like, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as the captain, I should let you know, we're all going to die. There's a red light on. I don't really even know what it means, but I'm pretty sure we're all going to die. Oh, wait, never mind. That light's off now. I don't even know why I was on. It's fine. Don't worry. Okay, go back to what you're doing right? That's engineers. Engineers only want to tell you the worst cases because that's what they're built to do. So I talk to those guys a lot and I need to get stories out of them for this video series I'm doing. So this is as close to what you asked me as I can do. Here's what I do. I basically say to them, um, who you're going to be addressing this information to are other guys just like you. They're engineers they're not going to trust me because I look like business and marketing. They don't know I have tech skills. And then I kind of wink at the engineer. I have tech skills. I'm on your side. And I say, and I need them to hear your secret code words to them that like, this is okay. And this is why you're here. And this is what you're doing. And so I try to really, I make sure the, the, the subject of the, that's going to have to be the one talking knows that they're addressing people who are into what they're into and who need to hear from that person's unique perspective. And I'll say, you don't have to say anything amazing. You have to say things that make people realize, oh, well, I know what I would think if I heard that. I'm going to make my own decision based on this. You're just helping other engineers make their decisions and expl by explaining what your decision was. We could do that, right? And I do a lot of um, very simple, um, almost like neuro-linguistic programming. We could do that, right? I'm like a sales guy. I'm doing the Sullivan nod. Like, you know, when you say, oh, do you want to get a Grey Goose martini? Yeah, okay. So I'm like, yeah. So you, you're pretty sure you're like, you'd, you'd be comfortable talking in a room with some engineers, right? 
Oh yes, absolutely. It's called the Sullivan nod, by the way. And you, uh, you say, yeah. So, I mean, this is, we're just talking to some engineers. I mean, there might be some marketing people, but you don't have to even address them, pretend they're not there. Or, you know, they always say, think of people naked, think of the marketers in clown suits because marketers are clowns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> marketers are clowns, you know, good and bad. That's all you got to do, Hattie. And you're saying what they're saying to their engineer friends. They forget everybody else. It's all good. So that's my, that's my goal. I've got a follow-up question because you're talking engineering and you know one of the things that we always talk about is knowing your audience who are you communicating to how are you going to communicate to them what are some of the steps and techniques you do to help identify who your audience is whether it's your primary or secondary or tertiary so I have a I have a really arcane secret I say who's going to be there or like who is this going out to it's wicked weird and um, every now and again I have to do these things with my fingers and then they say uh, marketers like okay phew. But to, to, to not be a dick, um, sometimes I don't know. And sometimes all I do is I communicate in a way that I'll try to talk to as many tribes as I can so that they hear that they hear me talking to them. It's like dog whistles, but not the racist version. It's like dog whistles where I'm saying a thing and someone else hears it and goes, I totally get what that means. And no one else has to get it. If I make a hip hop joke, which I've made three so far in this interview, if I make a hip hop joke and you don't like hip hop, it's okay. But my hip hop friends just went, oh, he likes these bands, right? So that's how. The other thing I try to do, though, if I'm live in a space, it's really different in Zoom. If I'm live in a space, I'm looking at faces. Are these people nodding? Are these people looking around? Are they on their phone? I'll stab people. Um, I, I need more of them on their phone because I can't stand if it's like church. So I need them to be doing stuff. It'd be great if they could eat some food at the same time. I need them not to listen to me like it's the last thing they're going to do on this planet. So my, my big opinion, I guess, is that the, um, the best way to communicate if you don't at all have a sense of who the audience is, is try to touch as many of them as you can and, and connect. But if you can, uh, use my ancient secret of asking because it works so much better if you have a sense of who these people are. Well, we've got about 12 minutes left to go in the uh, the webinar. We hope everyone's enjoying. And again, feel free to drop any comments or questions into the chat box. But we we do actually have a question that came in on the uh, the text line, Chris. And it's, mm. uh, what life lessons, business or personal life, have made a big impact on how you go about your day-to-day? -day? What life lessons? Uh, that's a too good a question. Monique, by the way, said she was enjoying it. So I just want to say, hey, Monique. Um fail and, and be okay with failing and try not to hurt people when you fail. That's a bit, that's an important life lesson. So I fail all the time. I fail every single day. If the day ends in why I probably have made a mistake or failed. Um, and if you mess it up for someone else, you got to go apologize. You'd be like, Oh, I just realized that that's a problem. I'm so sorry. You know, I had, I had a little personal issue happen right before this call. And I really had to say to the other person, uh, Look, I, I, I can't be here. Like, I, I, like I'm like i five minutes before being in front of a crowd. So my answer is I don't care whatever the kid wants to do, you know? So um, that's a crappy uh, parental ruling, by the way. Uh, <laughs> do some crack, who knows? So fail, right? So I'm going to go back and I'm going to apologize. I'm really sorry. I, I, I know I only had five minutes to talk with you, but I could have at least tried something. I could have punted and seen if it bounced against you. So apologize if you have to. Um, that's one. The other is always ask the question, you know, what's the goal here? What are we, what are we trying to get done here? Because there's times for everything, right? There's times when, you know, a good speech is going to be great. There's times when a good speech is the worst thing in the world. Uh, I was rewatching uh, Save It Private Ryan, maybe for the 7,008th time. And there's this scene where uh, all of a sudden, uh, Tom Hanks is the squad captain, and uh, everybody's suddenly at everybody's throats. Like, it's bad. It's nothing good. They're, one of their guys just died that everybody loves, and it, they're mad at each other. And he's supposed to give this speech because it's been a mystery throughout the entire movie where he grew up and what his job was. He hasn't told anybody. And, and so the speech is he's going to explain what it is, what his job was and all that. And it's a very, but the speech went on for pages in the script. And, St and Steven Spielberg was like, this is how it's going to be, Tom. It's going to be like this. And Tom is like, that's the dumbest thing in the world. It's got to be brief. Like, it's, it's got to hurt me to say these things. I don't want to give this information away because I know it's going to change the opinion of everybody I work with, you know, as a, as a captain of the army. They're going to lose something if they hear the speech, but I don't have anything. I'm out. I'm out of, I'm out of issues. So that was a really long oration to say, Austin, that... Um, 
you know, what am I trying to get done here? That's number two. Number three, always have an odd number of points to any question anyone asks you. I, I, I like it. I like it. And, and I think it's funny that you call in the old movies that we watch over and over and over and over again. Shawshank Redemption. I think I almost failed out of college because of that. It was like on TV. It's like, oh, there went that paper that was not going to get written exactly. anyway. Exactly. Um, so I got a question from Haley um, who asked about uh, what are your role models or people you looked up to growing up to get where you are now? You know, where's, where's your inspiration coming from? And paraphrase that, Haley. <laughs> Thanks, Haley. Endlessly, the answer is professional comics and comedians. I think that there is no um, career, such as it were, that's better suited to teach you how to be the best communicator in the world. I think, well, who is probably the number one in the world right now, I think that there's no one above Dave. Uh, if you look at what he shot during the quarantine, it's amazing. If you watch 846, which is his response, such as it is to the George Foreman, uh, 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 sorry, uh, George's story, um, the, the whole problem there is his 846 is hard and it's very complicated. And he, and he says, um, he says, it's not going to be okay. Uh, you know, you're not going to, George Floyd, it's not going to be okay because I'm going to tell you some really rotten things. And he goes, and if you're here and you're white and you're trying to feel how to be an ally, I'm going to make you feel worse, but I need you to hear this. And, and so you listen to every single word. And he, he says, this isn't a comedy special. I know you know that I'm Dave Chappelle and I know you know I'm a comedian. This one's not a comedy special. That was world changing. So he just, he just got the Mark Twain award uh, for being one of the best communicators in the world. So, so, Good on you, Dave Chappelle. Mm -hmm. Dave Chappelle just said, uh, hey, Netflix just put up the old Dave Chappelle show. I don't make a penny anytime that happens. I don't think that's cool. He said, I'm calling on you and I'm calling on Netflix to make this right by me. I want you to choose, you my friends, to choose to not watch the Chappelle show until we fix this. And they did. Can you imagine asking the masses? Talk about communicators. Asking the masses. He's rich, by the way. He, he's a rich guy saying, can you not watch this? Because I'd like some money for this as well. That's even crazier. This is, this is like as pro comms go. He's in the right, but he's a rich guy saying, I want even more money because they're not doing right by me. It's not the money. It's the doing right by me. And he made it happen. So my, my winners are always professional comedians. Uh, before anyone asks me, are there any great female comedians? Yes, there are. Uh, Fortune Femster. Uh, I like her a lot. Uh, she has a really great joke about being uh, a lesbian. And when she found out that Chick-fil-A supported lesbians, she said, well, I'm fat first and I'm lesbian second. Uh, she goes, so I got to eat my chick upset about everything. Uh, so she's been great. Uh, there's some incredible comics that have just really changed the uh, Hannah Gadsby. Uh, and, and what she did uh, with her special that Nanette, that people are still saying is that even comedy, who cares? That is what where where communications changes the world. And we think, ha ha ha, it's comedy, but the world changes because of it. So as a professional business communicator, I mean, why would you rather say, well, I like a IABC chapter for Tuscaloosa, uh, Norm Schwargel, who's been an IABC guy for 87 years, I think he's got some pretty good points when he says you got to say what you're going to say, then say it, and then say it again. Tell him what you told him. No. Comedians. Sorry, Norm. Okay. Since you love Dave Chappelle so much, what's a comedian that's not funny to you? Who's not funny? Uh, can I list a few thousand comedians that are not funny? <laughs> Just um, one is fine with me. <laughs> about any comedian that thinks sex is funny and sex is a funny topic comes right to mind. So uh, it, it's easy to get a, a laugh about sexual things because we're all awkward and uncomfortable as it is. So I find most of them not funny, but if, but if you mean the question, are they not funny because they've somehow stepped on a political boundary or something like that? I'm paying a lot of attention to that. So for instance, Bill Burr, uh, formerly a Massachusetts gentleman like myself, he keeps, uh, he, he's pretty anti um, uh, politically correct speech, but he, he also, like a lot of people don't understand kind of all of his perspective on it. He's trying to say, this isn't the problem. My jokes aren't the problem. The fact that some people laugh as if it's not a joke is the problem. That's what we're going to be looking at here. So I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a cancel culture guy. 
although I do, there's a lot of people who really need to be canceled for what they've done in their past. Um, I'm not looking for, you know, someone who maybe made a bad joke 11 years ago. It was a different time. You know, we, I played uh, video games and stuff in the seventies and eighties, where if you didn't uh, insinuate that your male friends weren't gay, um, you weren't a human on this planet earth, you know? So if someone says to me, whoa, you, you were like using that disparagingly. So was the planet earth. And then when you wake up one day and you're like, oh, maybe that's not a really good way to disparage people. It's like when they say you hit like a girl, uh, you ever watch uh, Ronda Rousey hit someone? I hope someone hits like a girl. They knock you right unconscious. There you go. You know, so I, I think that there's a, a there's a lot of great movements went, went around that reclaimed their words, and I'm all I'm all for it. I think that there's stuff that people maybe said a different way many years back that you know maybe they want to apologize, and that's okay. Maybe they can't apologize, but it's really and what are you going to do to make it better? So that's how I feel. There's plenty of really bad comedians. So there's so many comedians that just quote the same old stuff or worse they they go to be the safest person and hattie that's we can't have safe there you go nobody's safe that was my last question <laughs> wow well i think this has been a great discussion and i think there's a uh, so many great takeaways that you shared chris and you know i think i think with your last part on, on the comedians that we should always keep growing always keep learning i think that's just an, an incredibly important lesson and I want to thank everyone for joining today's webinar with Chris Brogan and I see we've got Bonnie Caver on as well she's the uh, uh the IEB chair for uh IBC or IBC International so Bonnie thanks for joining from hey, Austin Bonnie. which is also where uh Dave Chappelle is based right now so uh, Bonnie thanks for joining us and Chris uh we want to thank you so much for joining and, and for the people on here maybe they want to get in touch with you or follow your work or, or you know um the Batpack show, or maybe pick up one of your nine best-selling books. What is the best way for them to get in touch with you? Wow, Jessica's in Toronto. Sorry, I'm reading all the, the notes here. Um, oh my gosh, Bonnie, how many years is that? That's like 2008 or nine. Sorry, Austin. I had to do some, <laughs> I had to do some uh, bookkeeping. If you go to, uh, so here's my real request, chrisbrogan.com slash NL for my newsletter. My newsletter comes out every Sunday. If you hit reply, it goes right to me. Uh, I'm just like you. I pay someone to put on my pants one leg at a time and I answer my own email. So put it out to me, uh, chrisbrogan.com slash NL for newsletter. Um, that's probably the easiest. As far as my backpack show, it's just the backpack show dot online. And I'm always grateful for anyone who wants to check that show out because our, our goal there is to really to shine the light on people who uh, don't always get the spotlight. So it's a lot, a lot more BIPOC, LGBTQ plus, we're almost always looking for uh, interesting business insights from unusual places. Uh, and this whole week and a part of next week, I'm hosting all by myself without my co-host, Carrie. So there's even more chance for failure because I'm touching all the buttons. I don't think it's possible for you to fail, Chris. I think you do great work. And we encourage all of our attendees to go follow Chris, sign up for his newsletter. We dropped it in the chat. And if you want to continue and you know see what we're doing, uh, thebusinesscommunicators.com, that's our podcast. And uh, Chris, you can scroll back to the episode 12 of season three in which he's on. But one final reminder, uh, if you enjoyed today's session and you do want to win the, uh, the giveaway items, uh, you still have a little bit of time to text us. We've seen uh, a lot of texts come in. We'll text you back if you won on Monday. And that phone number, again, if you haven't done so already, is 713-360-0133. So text Chris Brogan to 713-360-0133. But we hope you enjoyed today's session. And uh, we'll see you next month in April. Take care, everyone.